And let's get started with today's uh, session that's on the CQL. Um, so we, we know that we have done a lot of CRUD operations, which is CRUD's basic instance for create, read, update, and delete. Uh, so for people who do not know what CRUD stands for, but that, this is the basic operation that you have to do uh, with uh, any database. And we are going to cover those app operations um, with regards to Cassandra, mainly through SQL, and then we'll also touch a bit on Thrift. So we have covered Thrift more in detail in terms of examples when we covered uh, Module 2 and Module 3. We, we talked about a lot of code on how to connect to that. But today we'll again do a, some kind of a refresher on that aspect also. So agenda for today is basically, again, doing some kind of a revision on uh, the read-write process that happens on Cassandra. We'll, we'll look into slice predicates. Um, that's uh, a topic a lot of people struggle with. Um, the DDL, DML things to SQL, um, a lot of people wanted to know and I've touched in brief, but we'll go into more details this thing. And we'll look at some examples of creating and modifying users, how to use batch new dates and batch delinks. Um, also importantly, we'll learn about importing and exporting data using SQL. So it will uh, provide you an easy interface of transferring files in and outside of Cassandra. We said that, um, uh, I think we already looked into uh, this thing, uh, loop thing. So what is SQL? SQL basically is a dialect of SQL. Uh, a lot of people already know SQL, they're comfortable with it. So uh, rather than letting people uh, or people who are coming from the SQL background, uh, instead of asking them to learn Java, instead of asking them to learn programming, instead of uh, asking them to learn Thrift, which is probably has a bigger or a difficult learning curve, uh, what the, the writers of Cassandra thought is to provide a SQL interface, which internally does all those things on the background, but for the person who was interacting with Cassandra can just interact with using their favorite query language for data processing, um, which is SQL. Why they don't call it SQL is because uh, it's a dialect of SQL. It does not support all the features of SQL. So that's why it's called as a Cassandra query language. It's Though the syntax is almost similar, but some of the features are not supported. Uh, so we'll, we'll look into uh, some of um, those things. Uh, basically, SQL is, is a very is simple uh, interface if uh, for non-programmers or people, even for programmers, they'll find it to interact with SQL much easier rather than writing a, a hundred line program. Okay, so um, let's look at the reads and writes in Cassandra. We've already looked into it, but uh, again, we'll do a brief revision. So writes in, in Cassandra are highly available. We already saw that Cassandra is more tuned for availability that rather than consistency. So uh, you can scale writes really well in Cassandra. It's very, very fast. You can scale up to 1 billion uh, transactions per second or writes per second. Uh, that's the strength uh, Cassandra has. Uh, there are a lot of benchmarks that people have done on writing Cassandra. So uh, it can be done really good. All writes in Cassandra are append only. We saw um, in some of the previous modules how the write process happens. Uh, from uh, being logged into the commit log, into mem tables, and finally it lands into SS tables. So we already have looked into the write workflow. Uh, writes in Cassandra are always atomic, but it does not support ACID kind of transactions. So uh, an important point to note here. Uh, now, now reads also are, are very easy in, in, in Cassandra. Uh, we saw how the read process happens. It looks into SS tables, it looks into mem tables, and uh, derives data back. We also saw some advanced strategies for uh, tuning up the reads. That is namely the using the cache, the key cache and the row cache um, can be uh, significant in terms of scaling up the reads. Now, if you don't use any of the caching mechanism, reads are uh, normally slower than the writes. But if you enable the, the caching layer on, on top of Cassandra, then your reads and writes would be equally performant. Uh, that's, that's the beauty of Cassandra. Um, Consistency levels. Now, um, let's do some kind of a recap on, uh, on, on the cap here. And we saw uh, there were there were three things uh, that we could always keep out of the three. We could always maintain two. So uh, in terms of consistency, Cassandra is eventually consistent. But the consistency thing can be tunable in Cassandra. That's the beauty of the, though it's, too, um, um, it's uh, 
by default tune for availability, you can tune your consistency and then uh, maybe uh, compromise on availability if you need it. If you need a higher consistency, you can still go for that using Cassandra. And that's what we are going to look at, uh, different consistency levels that you can follow in Cassandra and how uh, that are going to be helpful for you. So uh, Cassandra if, uh, has um, like uh, different timestamps for each values. So if two nodes respond to different timestamps, newest times um, values always wins. That's the kind of the default behavior. Um, and it internally does some kind of a read repair. That this is also something that we saw. So let's look at some of the consistency levels that uh, Cassandra offers. Uh, so that it would be more clear for how, how to tune uh, the consistency in Cassandra. Before I move to the, consist the consistency levels, let me see if there are any questions till this point of time so that I can clear them up. Okay, uh, looks like there's uh, no question at this point of time. Uh, so moving on. So here are the different consistency levels that uh, Cassandra provides. Now Cassandra provides the consistency levels for both uh, reads as well as writes. Uh, most of the time the consistency uh, is more implied for the, the read part. Um, and, and these are the different uh, consistency levels. The, the, the zero consistency is not supported in uh, Cassandra because it's a distributed system so you always want at least one uh, of the node to give you an answer. Now any is also not supported. You cannot uh, have uh, any number of nodes support. So instead of that, um, the CL.1 or consistency level 1 is um, the by default behavior. Now what is the cons consistency level? Uh, so consistency level stands for returning a record uh, held by the first node that responds to the query. So it, uh, we know that internally Cassandra queries the other nodes or other replicas for the values, but when you have a consistency uh, level set for one, the, the uh, return value would be immediately sent to the client and then uh, Cassandra would internally do some kind of a read repair operation in the background. But it won't block returning the value to uh, the client Instead, it would uh, return the, the value back and then in the background it would do a read repair if the values are out of date. Now the second uh, interesting consistency level uh, that Cassandra offers is uh, the quorum thing because if you look at, uh, if you want a higher consistency, one is probably dangerous in terms of uh, you, if you're lucky, if your things are not out of date or if you query the node which has the latest value then you are in, in luck. But unfortunately if you query some kind of node which has an outdated value and if you have a consistency level of 1 you are going to get a stale value though it's going to be repaired in the background and then after some time you'll have the right value but if that, if you care for consistency for each request then you're probably going to uh, need to set up a higher value. So I'm going to uh, um, Covered the extreme, so we uh, looked at one. Let's look at the other extreme, which is all. So we'll took, uh, talk about quorum later, but we'll talk about all first, so that you will understand what the quorum stands for. So all is query all the nodes. So we, we saw that in one, it looks, uh, it returns the value from the first node, and then internally it does the read repair. But in in all, what happens? It, it queries all the nodes, and the the call is still blocked, so it won't return a value. And in, in all what happens is uh, it basically looks if there is a disparity in values. If there is a disparity in value, it will first do a correction of those nodes and then return a value back to the, the client. That's all, um, uh, that is what all stands for. Um, now you'll understand that what is the, now if you just said it to all, uh, you'll always maintain higher consistency, but there's a downside to that. And the downside to that is performance because in an all call, uh, you have blocked the client till you return uh, or do a read repair of all the nodes and replicas that uh, need to be updated. Uh, this is certainly going to affect your performance in terms of your, if your performance matters. And if we are, uh, it, it might cause a lot of delays because there might be bottlenecks in, in IO that uh, you might find with the all call. And if you have a higher replication factor, Say if your if your data is really critical, or somebody in a, like a data architect in your team decides that 
three is not enough, you need to keep a consistency level of, or a replication factor of five, then it would still contact much more nodes, so your performance would still go down if you keep the level of all. So what's the, the middle way or what's the golden path around this? So the golden path is the, the quorum uh, consistency level that's being offered. So what this does, it, it does a query to all the nodes, but it finds the, the re, a majority of replicas. So once the majority of replicas respond to the client with the most recent timestamp and it, it has the most recent value, then it would return the, the value back to the client and then do a read repair of the others that are out of sync. So if the majority, so if I have three nodes and two nodes say that I have the same value, but the third is out of date in terms of the timestamp uh, thing, it will um, kind of return the value and then do a read repair. But say if the case is other way around, so if I have three nodes and only one node has the latest value, the other two do not have the nodes, then in that case a read repair happens before and then the value is returned. So even in, in, in forum there, there might be a possibility of some kind of a performance lag, but the, the possibility is really, really low. Most of the times it will look for the majority of the values. If it's, it's good, it does not have to query all the other or need to wait for read repair of all the other nodes, it will immediately send the values back. And most of the time we found that uh, Quorum works pretty well most of the time. Uh, if your application is ultra sensitive to consistency, in that case only you go for all, otherwise most of the times uh, Quorum is, is the best way out. Again, e even if you want to go for all, just keep in mind um, the performance pe penalty that is associated with it. If uh, you are okay with, or the application is okay with the performance penalty, then certainly um, the all uh, level also works fine. Okay, so we saw uh, about reads. Now let's look about writes. Before I jump to writes, let's see if there are any questions. Okay, Narendra is complaining about no audio. I, um, Narendra, can you contact support? Uh, I hope all others can uh, have the audio clear. Um, so Benjamin is asking a question, all slide says it sends record to client before read repair. Did it? Uh, no, what it says is the queries all nodes which for all nodes response return to the client with the most recent timestamp, but it does a read repair for. Um, if it's, uh, yeah, I know probably the slide, uh, the content is not correct. What it does is for all it does a read repair before and then only it sends the, um, the client values back for all. If, it's, uh, if this slide is saying that the performance is probably wrong, um, I, I'll take a note and maybe correct it for the next time. Thanks for pointing out. Okay. Okay, so um, saw so reads, now let's look at writes. Uh, so again, um, the basic question that you might, guys might have is consistency is for reads, like what has writes to do with it? So uh, let's look at uh, writes as basically to do with replication factor. So um, a, a, a consistency level of zero says that the write operation will return immediately to kind before the, the write is recorded or uh, if once the, it's written into the commit log, it will re, uh, return the call back to the, the client. So that client is not blocked at that time. That's the consistency level of zero. So even if it lands in the commit log and uh, say it fails, say the node fails before it uh, is able to write it to the mem table, uh, that won't affect the client. So it's, it's kind of a bit dangerous in that sense. Uh, because we, we know that if it's not able to log it in the mem table, then we'll have to manually, uh, the admins have to manually rerun the, the commit logs to have uh, to do a kind of a, a complete read repair of the node. So, um, uh, so but in terms of, um, if you don't care for that, if you are li like uh, writing a kind of a stock operation where your values are changing every second and if you even miss that call, uh, you don't matter because if you have a consistency level of zero in terms of write, uh, remember your writes are going to be very, very fast. 
So if you want, if your only aim is to just scale rights and your application is such that it kind of self-corrects itself, then it's certainly a, a good uh, kind of configuration to keep because then it keeps your uh, rights very, very fast. Uh, you can log information. Uh, most of the time, failures are rare, but still you need to write your application so such that uh, you ensure that the failure handling is done properly. You cannot just re, uh, rely on uh, the the notion that failures are not very rare. You need to design it with the notion that failures can happen and how to make your application secure. But there are certain applications which do not care for the such thing because the data is moving so fast that even if a node dies for some millisecond, it's going to be probably going to be stale. So in such scenarios, G, uh, zero consistency level comes to use. Uh, consistency level of any is uh, ensuring the value is written to a minimum of one node, uh, allowing hints, like we, we saw the hinted handoff thing, um, to uh, allowing hints to the count as, as you write. So that's the consistency level of any. So it put it to any uh, kind of thing. Uh, one is, and any is kind of a very similar thing, but it, it's, it's primarily uh, has a, a subtle difference. It ensures that your commit log and mem table uh, to at least one node is done. In, in any, if you even have it to the commit log, that's fine. You don't need to be gone to the, the mem table. But in, in the consistency of level of one, you need to ensure, or the Cassandra ensures that it is written to the commit log and the mem table of at least one node before it returns back. Quorum, again, is a majority of uh, things. So if you have three replicas, it will ensure that it has written to the commit log and the mem table of at least two nodes and then return the call back to the, the client. Uh, and it will, in background, write it to the third replica or whatever um, re number of replicas you have. Uh, so uh, Quorum basically says that you'll write it to the majority of them and then uh, the others would be uh, written in the background. It certainly, such kind of thing helps in terms of performance, uh, especially the quorum call, because what quorum ensures is that you have, uh, you won't have any data loss because you have written to two nodes. So even if you write it to one node and if that goes down, you still have it uh, in one replica. So it's immediately available. Uh, so if you're writing some kind of a, a, a shopping cart application or something where you cannot miss that uh, uh, the, the content of the card, then this is probably a, a good way to use. You can use a quorum in, in that place, but you don't have to wait for all the replicas to be written because that would speed up your performance if you, if you don't wait for that the third write. And the third write can then happen at its leisure. It can ha happen in background. Now, uh, the, the last option of the extreme consistency level uh, is, is all. Um, all ensures that all the nodes, um, like like the, the first node and the number of replicas, have it written into the, the commit log, the, the mem table entries, and then only the call returns back to the client. Uh, all, all ensures that you have a, a very uh, low or negligible chance for any data loss. So if, is, if your data is that critical um, and you cannot rely even on the quorum, um, maybe I, I would say all is a bit of a paranoid step, but if uh, your application demands uh, that you be uh, so paranoid about your data, then you can certainly um, have the all uh, consistency level set with write. But again, uh, remember your writes will slow down. So if you're doing a lot of writes, and if you're setting a, a, a consistency level all, then it, your writes will slow down. But if you are having a, a kind of a shopping cart example, uh, or shopping cart application where your traffic is not that much, in, in uh, probably a second, you are having a, like a thousand writes per second. Certainly, you can go for this all consistency level. Okay, so I, I hope these uh, these things were, were pretty simple and, and clear to understand. Um, so uh, so let's see on the the data types in SQL. Um, what are those different data types? Uh, that SQL offers. We already saw uh, the, the CLI interface. I also showed you the SQL SH interface that day. Um, uh, it's a very simple uh, SQL-like uh, command line interface. So, but we'll all again do some kind of a revision of the, the SQL things. So basically what CQL offers is a rich set of uh, data types in, uh, for columns. 
um, that are defined in, in, in a table. Uh, the difference between SQL and CQL uh, is probably the SQL provides you much more advanced uh, collection types that are not available in any of the relational database things like you can have maps and sets and lists uh, kind of supported using the, the SQL interface. So this is something that's different from the SQL thing uh, and that's why uh, SQL I would say is much more advanced in that concept uh, but it does not support some of the features that SQL supports. Uh, so um, let's look at um, how to define key spaces and column uh, families using the, the SQL interface here. Uh, be before we do that, let, let's have a, a quick rundown on what are the native data types. Um, again, they are they're very, very simple and we've already gone through this again. It's basically ASCII, big ends, blobs, Boolean counters, decimal, timestamp, time UIDs, um, the, the usual list, uh, nothing uh, surprising here. Let's look at counters. Now, we kind of went through uh, uh, the counters thing in some of the initial modules, but what a counter column is, is as a special type of column that you can define in Cassandra, uh, used for incrementing and decrementing things. So if you define a particular column as, as a counter column, then um, Cassandra would do some kind of a, uh, optimizations in the background for handling or uh, incrementing, decrementing such kind of thing. So uh, again, what's what's a counter column? It's basically uh, for supporting counters, and the counters basically uh, column does not exist until you first increment or decrement uh, the the first value. So you can initialize the value by say a hundred, but unless you in, increment it to hundred and one or decrement ninety nine, it uh, does not get um, kind of uh, uh, um, it exists in Cassandra. It would be kept in mem, mem tables or something, but once you kind of uh, do uh, countering, then it will start saving that data. Now deletion is also supported for, so you can delete the, the counter column as uh, uh, is with the, the normal column type. So uh, the, the detail, basically a counter column is supporting a, an integer type of um, value, so 64-bit signed value is the kind of values that this counter column would support. Um, wh why you would use that is uh, maybe you want have a website where you want to kind of show a counter for website hits or some kind of thing, so that's where you could use this special kind of column. Uh, it basically depends on your web application need or your application need if you want to keep some kind of counter information uh, all the time, maybe for indexing reasons, you can certainly use this. Okay, uh, let's look at some of the limitations that counters offers. So though counters might be great for keeping the counter information, you all also have to think about the, the limitations. Now the, the limitations is that you cannot use the counter column as a primary key. Now you'll understand that this is for obvious reasons, because if your values are continuously changing, then you have difficulty to keep track of what the row key was. Uh, that means that indexing also becomes difficult, because if your values are going to change, quite often indexing does not make any sense uh, to keep. So these are certain things that you should keep in mind while um, using counters as a, as a column in Cassandra. Let's look at something called as triggers. Uh, what are triggers? So you probably are aware of um, what are triggers in a, in a database, uh, people coming from the relational background, but even for, I'll, I'll just give a brief of, for people who do not know what triggers are. Triggers are something or a kind of function that gets invoked when a, a column changes its value. So say a column has a particular value and you change a value and application changes the value of that particular column, internally you can write a kind of a function that will get invoked whenever there's a change in value. So if you want to do some kind of a cascading effect, say if a particular value changes for a particular column, you want some other two columns to change. You want, say, to uh, change a counter column by using a trigger function or uh, this is just one example or you want to change something else. That can certainly be done using the set of triggers. So triggers are basically functions that get automatically in invoked if there is a change in value. So these are background things that happen. Uh, the database does it, uh, application does not. So if you want to um, invoke also, triggers are offered by 
uh, with Cassandra 2.0 also previous versions do not support triggers. This was a very uh, new feature that was uh, recently introduced. Uh, but it's very similar to the RDBMS world trigger. So the way you create a trigger is basically saying that create trigger, you, your, your name of the trigger on a particular table and then using this, this name of the class. So you have to use the or the Apache Cassandra triggers got inverted index class to kind of create a trigger. So um, this uh, inverted index or or the Apache Cassandra triggers is basically a Java class which kind of implements your triggers. Uh, again, um, this is a very simple way of creating triggers. You can also drop triggers, very simple syntax, drop trigger your trigger on a particular table. So do try out um, some kind of a sample on uh, any of the columns that you have created. Uh, create a, a sample, uh, say a column family or a, create some a sample columns like two or three columns and then create a trigger on uh, one of the columns while just um, what you can do is for uh, your test purposes or uh, uh, an exercise purposes, what you can do is you can define three columns and uh, you can create an in, uh, a trigger on column number one. Now you can write a, a, a trigger in such a way that uh, if your column one value changes, then just append that value to the two other columns just as an exercise so um, that you can get a hang of how to use triggers in, in Cassandra. Okay. Let's look at the, the use cases of triggers. Um, again, if you want to be enforced input validation, uh, which is one of the most important things um, in uh, the database world. Uh, in relational databases, there, there's a long or, or very strong uh, cons uh, data type checking uh, or kind of a value checking that is offered in, in databases, but that's not that strictly enforced in the NoSQL world. But by using triggers, you can still um, get the best of both worlds. You can scale your rights and in the background, you can have triggers which will do validations. And based on the validations, you can take certain uh, more actions. So that's the, the primary use of using triggers. You can do input validation. You can also do replication and migration modifications from one table space to another. Uh, that's an, another example of using triggers. You can do uh, um, extra logging if you want to do, uh, if there's some problem that you need to keep watch of if certain, say you have a banking application or stock trading application and you want to uh, do some kind of a stop loss thing. So if a value of a particular stock goes below a certain thing and you want to trigger some, something to happen, you can use triggers there where you can set up a workflow um, and, and to raise up alarms. So, and uh, lastly, if there's some kind of uh, alert or notifications that you want to uh, have in your application, maybe you have a, a, some kind of a mobile application and if the value changes, then you want to notify uh, some people in, in uh, on uh, say, say a Twitter-like application, then certainly triggers could be used um, for uh, such use cases. Okay, uh, now let's look at SQL functions. Before I jump to SQL uh, functions, let me see if there are any questions regarding triggers or counters. Okay, so they are. So Madhusudan is asking, can we use a counter in a column family containing two columns like product name, product available, quantity? Uh, yeah, certainly you can use that as a counter. Um, you can keep the product quantity as, as a counter. But, um, but normally counters are used where your value is going to be incremented pretty fast, like maybe on, on a per minute or uh, after certain seconds if it's going to be incremented. Not that it's a restriction of such things, but you can certainly use it in the use case that you have defined, certainly it's possible. So Narain is asking uh, who creates inverted index? So the, the class that's defined, um, that's, that's the class that uh, is responsible for creating an inverted index internally. That's the class that does uh, the, the, the one that I specified here. Uh, the org Apache Cassandra triggers dot inverted index is a Java class which would do the inverted indexing. Okay, so moving on, let's look at uh, SQL functions. So uh, they, these are certain functions that you can do. Uh, like in, in SQL, you, you know that there, there are certain functions that can be invoked like max, average, sum, 
Um, so similarly, uh, functions are also supported uh, in, in the CQL interface. Now, most of the time, functions are most uh, times are used for aggregations. Um, uh, but in SQL, the aggregation functions are not kind of supported at, at least till now. Uh, what uh, functions uh, C, uh, the CQL functions uh, supports is the token the time UID functions and the blob conversion functions at this point of time. So all the advanced functions are kind of uh, not supported at least till now, but in future they, they might also be supported. Okay, so let's look at the, the token function, uh, what the token function does. So a token function basically allows to complete the token for a given partition. So um, the exact nature of uh, token function depends on the table concern and the partitioner to be used. We saw that uh, there can be various partitioning schemes that you can use, like you can use the random partitioner, you can use the total order partitioner, or you have to have a, a special, your own custom partitioner. Uh, you want your token values to be returned, uh, so that this is a function that uh, can be invoked. Uh, the type of arguments for the token depend on the type of partition key columns that you want to do. So these are the three kind of partitioners that are kind of available uh, in using Cassandra. Uh, one is the MoMA uh, three partition, which is a special hashing algorithm um, that uh, can be used in Cassandra. The second is the random partitioner, and uh, the third is the basically the byte order or the total order partitioning uh, that offers. So the, the, each has a different uh, return types. Uh, the first has uh, as a big end, the random partitioner has as a variant, and uh, the byte order partition has as a blob. So uh, based on that, uh, you'll, you'll get the, the token function. You'll basically, what this does is gives you the token key uh, for that particular value. Uh, time UID functions. Now, time UID basically is, uh, is used a lot of time in the, the web, uh, in the web applications or any kind of applications if for time stamping because you want to know what happened at that particular timestamp and then there can be different uh, values for different timestamps happening. So most of the times you want to find out uh, things like what's the, uh, the current time, or what is the date uh, with respect to uh, the, the timestamp. Uh, you want to find the, the unique timestamp value, minimum and maximum time UIDs are also uh, uh, supported uh, using the time UID functions. So, um, these are the two basically uh, functions. There's, there's also a, a, a third function called as the now function. What now function is basically gives you the unique uh, time UID is for like generating uh, unique random values. So if you want to use that, um, certainly go for uh, the now function. So uh, unique time UID sta basically states the time when the statement uh, using it is, is executed. So you can keep track important uh, um, information, like you can log certain things, like what happened at a particular timestamp using uh, the now function. Uh, there's also another function that's supported is in terms of the blob conversions. Now we know that uh, uh, a lot of uh, blob operations are supported in Cassandra. So uh, a number of uh, functions to convert the, the native types into blo binary blob um, are supported uh, using the Cassandra SQL interface. Uh, one of the, the things the, that is supported is for every uh, native type, like the non-blob type, there is a, a type as blob function which would convert a particular native value into a, a blob value. Um, also, there you can return a, a blob value, and if you want to convert it, say there, there's a blob value, and you want to convert it into a string, or you want to convert it into int, uh, name, and you know that the, those values were int or uh, a string uh, beforehand, or you can cast it. Uh, then certainly, a, a blob as a type functions are also available, so you can convert um, blob uh, to int, blob as int, blob as string, such kind of all those functions are also supported using the SQL functions interface. Now let's look at uh, the, the SQL uh, or SQL collections. Now uh, we talked about the, the SQL and SQL differences. Uh, basically since Cassandra is written in Java, all the, the Java uh, data structures are kind of supported by default in, in, in the Cassandra uh, database. So uh, Java being an object-oriented language, uh, 
very much supports maps, sets, and lists. The, so uh, people who, uh, who are aware of the Java programming language will find it very, very easy. But for others uh, who aren't much familiar with, with Java, will will find that um, you can read up about what are maps and sets. And but basically, maps is basically a key-value pair data structure where you provide a, a key and then you can return a value. A sets is basically a set of values. You can ha keep it unique uh, that way and the list is just a, a list of values where your values can be repeated. Um, so, but it's in a particular order. So uh, these are the three collections that uh, SQL supports. Let's look at how maps can be uh, used. Say you want to have uh, a, a, basically a key value pair kind of thing. So if you look at Cassandra uh, and if you look at maps, basically a column having multiple key value pairs can, is defined as a map. So if you think about it. So um, maps are internally stored by the keys. So internally they are sorted on, on the keys. Uh, it keeps the order of, of those keys that way. And the map data is kind of represented in a JSON um, inspired syntax. Uh, how we create a, a, a map function or you use a, a, a map type is basically if you want to create a say example, if you look at the example here, you look at create table for the visit visitors, um, ID text is your primary key, uh, text is basically the type, ID is basically the primary key or the row uh, key. Then you have the, the, the given name, the surname, and uh, the favorites. So if we, if you want to have a, a, a favorites of a particular uh, hotel visitors, then it can be have a, a key value pair. So we can uh, keep different information about um, the, the favorites for a particular hotel visitor. So this is the way you can keep uh, multiple information for a particular ID. So for one ID, I want to maintain there are more than one favorites for a particular ID. So this is way, one way you can keep, uh, use a map to, uh, for, for your benefit. Okay, sets, sets are also uh, very similar to maps, but the only difference is maps is a key value stair, uh, set is just a, a unique collection of values, it does not have a key value, it just has keys, or you can say it just has values. So a very simple uh, data structure. Again, how you can create is if you have, say, you want to create a table like hotel images, you can create uh, your name is your tree, your owner is another column, you have a timestamp, and then you have a set of tags that you want to keep for your hotel image. So if you have a hotel image and you want to tag it by saying it's a five star, it's located by the beach, um, then it has an airport nearby, it has excellent communication. So these are various tags that you can keep. It's extremely scenic. Um, it, you can see the, the sunset. So these are different tags that you want to associate with a particular image. You can keep uh, such kind of information together using the set uh, collection type. Now, all the values are always ordered in the set. So it's an important thing that you should keep in mind. So if you want to, uh, if you want, uh, if you, you don't have to secondary do a sort. So all the values would be sorted and then kept in the set, so you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> so these are the simple uh, map, uh, set, and list. So let me go the list uh, interface, and then I'll uh, take any questions regarding the, the collection types. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, again, the uh, list is a, uh, a simple data structure. It basically keeps a collection of non-unique values, but it uh, the important thing, difference uh, between a map or a set is a map and set have uh, not, uh, uh, unique values, but uh, in list uh, or in list uh, interface, you'll have a non-unique set of values. So your values can be repeated, but it needs to be in a particular order. So it will maintain order in the way it was inserted. So if you list a particular value uh, before. Uh, uh, Another value, say value one and value two, and value one was inserted before, it will always return you value one in, in, a, in a particular order and value two later. So that's the <coughs> important aspect about using lists. Again, if you want to use uh, the, the list um, the type, here's how you use it. Say you want to have the, the hotel revenue. Uh, so you create a table called hotel revenue and you want to keep the ID 
the, the hotel name for that, the visitors, and then you want to keep the, the amount. Uh, what are the different amount um, that was maintained in, in, in a list fashion? So uh, that's that's the kind of the a way you can keep. Uh, uh, this is an example of using the list collection types using the SQL interface. Before we move to Thrift, let me see if there are any questions on the, the three types that we saw. Uh, okay, so Shweta is asking, how about update operation? Do you add one more write? with a new version, is that an update? Um, uh, update. So how updates happen is basically, uh, we kind of covered this last time, but let me revise you again, that how update happens is if there's a, is a column, uh, you know that all the values are append only. So every value has some kind of a timestamp associated with that. So if they say uh, there's a column uh, called a state, See, I'll give you an example. See, and the, the current state is California. And then you move from California to, to say, Texas. Uh, your, uh, so the Cassandra would save both the values, but the, um, um, the latest timestamp would be for Texas. So if you want to derive a query for a state of a particular ID, it would return Texas instead of uh, California. But California value would still be there existent in, in Cassandra. Uh, based on the time to live that you have specified. So updates are done in, in this fashion. Uh, your old value is not deleted as such. Uh, it's just that it won't be returned. But if you query for what was my uh, state when for an X timestamp, then it would return. And if it stands, uh, uh, in, if the California timestamp stands in that, then the value would be returned that way. I, I hope the, this was uh, clear for you. So Asit is asking, can I add a column to the uh, column family using SQL? Yes, you can certainly uh, add a column to the column family using the SQL. We'll see uh, some of the examples. Um, so Parthipan asks, why is partition required in Cassandra? So the reason for partitioning thing was to distribute your data. You don't want to keep all your data in, into one node. You want to basically uh, distribute your data across all the nodes so that you have a balanced cluster. If you remember, try to remember decentralization and all this thing. So you don't want to keep everything and, and one side you want to spread it across. That's why partitioning is required. Asit is asking, can I do a select PN? Uh, these data types, uh, maps, and, and sets in SQL. Uh, you can certainly um, uh, do a select queries kind of thing for um, doing um, you know, for, with these data types like maps and sets. We saw that uh, these are used in, in the collection type. So when you create a table, you have to def uh, basically uh, create it with maps and sets. And then you, when you use a, a SQL, basically you're going to get a, a return type as a map and set. And then uh, basically in your your uh, Java code, or if you most of the times you would uh, need your Java code to uh, basically iterate toward the map and the set. So uh, there's also certain things um, I, I, I look into. I haven't looked into how you can flatten a particular map uh, using the SQL, uh, but I think there there is something that you can do even with the the SQL without even touching the Java code. Okay, so Samir is asking, can you show me an example where uh, your query by timestamp exactly uh, example previous value? not the latest one or last two updates. Okay, uh, so I'll show you in, in, a, in a text file. So what you can do is basically say you have a, a table called as, um, what do I call it? See a hotel location. So, uh, and there's a, uh, so the table is hotel location. And then the, the column name is location. So what you can do is basically select location from hotel location. And by default, there's a time UID column. So they, it exists by default in, in any table. So you can say time UI, UI uh, ID equals to say uh, so Unix timestamp. So 
is greater than or less than you can do that or greater than or equal to or less than equal to you can give time ranges into uh, say a, so this is how a timestamp value would be represented in a unix timestamp so uh, there are a lot of uh, date to unix time converters available on the net you could you provide a particular date and uh, get uh, a unix timestamp value out of it and then you basically have to supply uh, this timestamp value so so if your timestamp uh, so what it would do is basically uh, say this uh, column was so to give you a more concrete example say uh, for this column location uh, this was say ca no, or it was california at this time and say an older timestamp had Texas, so so this was say maybe one. So an older timestamp was uh, Texas, and the newer timestamp is, is California. So if you do this this query that I've supplied here, it would return in California. But if you do the other way around, so if it's less than or equal to, if you do this, then it would return you Texas. So you can do range kind of queries uh, for finding out what were the values. So, and this is provided your time to live value has not expired. Um, so if you have kept like uh, for a column to expire within 24 hours or something, um, something crazy and if this value goes away because Cassandra inter, uh, internally has deleted it, then you won't get any value out of it. But uh, if it's there, then it will return you the, the right value. Okay, so moving on. Uh, let's look at uh, thrift. Um, it's it's nine twenty three, guys. So uh, let me know if you guys want to take a, a break before we we jump into uh, into thrift, uh, or if it's okay, then I, I'll continue. Let me know. Okay. So there is a request of break. So let me take uh, uh, one final question, and then we can take a break for ten, uh, 10 minutes. Um, so Asit is asking, so the timestamp is a conversion of a date time. Hence, if I want to fetch an end data for a specific date, I can do that. Yes, you can uh, do it basically based on a, a particular timestamp. So how you can uh, do is basically take any date time and then use a Unix timestamp converter it will give you the the integer value for um, that particular date and time in unix timestamp format and then you can use this value uh, to in the where clause for the time uid for that particular column and that should be it okay uh, so there is a request of uh, a break for 10 minutes so it's uh, 925 exactly right now let's meet at 935 uh, sharp so that we can continue uh, with the conversion let's take a break guys thanks So let's look at thrift. Um, we saw in uh, some of the modules before, thrift is uh, a by default kind of uh, a protocol used for exchanging information in, in Cassandra. Internally, Cassandra uses thrift to efficiently transfer messages from one node to another uh, or for uh, writing any information to Cassandra or reading any information from Cassandra, thrift protocol is, is used. So we'll, we'll look at a brief introduction of, of, of Thrift for people who want to use Thrift through the programming interface. For people who want to use the SQL interface 
might not worry much about the, the thrift, but internally CQL also uses thrift to create uh, thrift objects and then send it across the wire. So we'll look at some of the APIs for the client implementation um, and then we uh, see what uh, the design benefits of thrift. So uh, typically what thrift offers is the language independence. So you can write thrift in many languages. You can write it in Java, Python, uh, there's a whole bunch of languages that thrift supports uh, and then you don't have to worry about. So you can uh, write your uh, um, thrift messages in, in one language and read it in, in uh, some other languages. It becomes language agnostic. Uh, it becomes also a common transport uh, interface for communicating in, with uh, different languages and it's very efficient in saving your data structures. So rather than sending information in a text form, you can save and send it in a, in a binary form uh, encapsulated in a, in a thrift protocol. Uh, also, it has a very rich support about uh, versioning, so your schema evolution for your thrift and all this thing can be uh, supported really well. Though the, the application developer need not worry about all this thrift versioning things, they are typically managed by the Apache uh, project people, so they can uh, certainly um, uh, upgrade your thri uh, the thrift interfaces internally for Cassandra without uh, uh, having any uh, impact on the external clients. Uh, so let's look at what the thrift protocol is basically in, in general. Uh, what it does is it has these different components um, on the server side as well as the client side. So you have your, your code that you want to be executed, you want, uh, and then the, there are all those transport related uh, facilities uh, that exist. The read write functions which, which basically stand for serializing and deserializing your data. Uh, then your transport protocol is defined, uh, called it the T protocol and the T-transport uh, layer classes are there. All this code is generated by default or in the background. You don't have to do anything. You just have to define the schema. Even in Cassandra, you don't have to dis decide this is what happens in the background. Uh, so code is generated using the Thrift compiler and then it's able to efficiently talk uh, between the client and the server system. As far as the application development side is concerned, you don't have to directly talk or no Thrift to talk to Cassandra. You need to know a higher level APIs like Hector to talk to what Hector and the SQL interface does. Is you internally use this thrift to communicate. This is just for your understanding of how things will happen. Again, a list of supported libraries. You can see a lot of languages are being supported. You can write things in Java, Python, Scala. So um, Hector is one of the Java APIs to connect uh, to Cassandra. Now there can be other APIs in the, that are written in Python, Scala, .NET. You can use any of the languages. You just need a client, or you can write a client of your own. If you know, if you're very familiar with Thrift, and you can write a client in any of these languages, and then uh, can communicate with with Cassandra in your la uh, choice of your language. If not, there by default there is uh, Java that you can use to communicate with Cassandra. Uh, let's look at indexes. Uh, what are secondary indexes? So what secondary indexes does uh, means in Cassandra is indexing on uh, values of any other column other than the primary key is nothing uh, but a secondary index. So uh, uh, the, the primary key is, is always indexed in, in any of the database systems but if you want to index on any of the values of a column which is not a primary key uh, for if uh, for some performance reasons, then you can certainly use the secondary index in Cassandra. Advantage is um, operational ease of populating and maintaining that index, and then um, you can certainly uh, index is uh, is a is a very powerful tool that you can use uh, in Cassandra. So if you want to do a, a wild range query or uh, a, a wild card query, if you want to do search based on values, so you can say that give me all the data where my values is something like this. This uh, is such type of queries are certainly speed up if you have a second, secondary index um, created on, on your data. Uh, secondary indexes are most of the time built in the background autom uh, automatically. If you already have said that, okay, make this particular column, uh, set it as a secondary index, then it would be created uh, in, in a background without blocking any reads or write operations. So whenever you do a write, 
it does not block it, uh, the right uh, uh, would operation would be returned to the client but Cassandra would internally start doing the secondary indexing operation. Um, let's see how we can create a, a secondary index kind of uh, a thing. So uh, the example here is the Cassandra CLI, but the same example can be executed in the Cassandra SQLSH uh, interface. Uh, no difference there. So uh, let's look at uh, the, the examples here. So you can say create a column family with a comparator. Uh, provide the the column data, um, the column names, um, the the value types, and uh, and then you can say the the index type here. So if you specify index type as keys, this would be the 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 secondary index specified. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, or there's another way you can add an index to an existing uh, column family. You can do an update. You can do an update command for a, for a column family and then this is how you can specify the, 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 the secondary index for that. So if you, once you have created a secondary index for, for state, say if you want to find out all the values uh, Say you want to get all the users of a city is Lucknow. If you want to get all the users for Lucknow, um, if you haven't set it up as a secondary index, what uh, Cassandra would do, it would scan all the data for that particular uh, column family. Um, that would be a very extremely slow operation, especially if you have a huge amount of data. But if you have already set up the, the secondary index, then all this operation would be really, really fast. And it would reply, uh, return you back values much more easier and faster. So uh, think about, uh, based on your application, what would uh, make use of such values. If your application really requires a secondary index or not, should also be thought about. Most of the time, uh, indexes are performance penalties in RDBMS systems, but uh, such is not the case in terms of Cassandra. Cassandra efficiently handles indexes, so you could use it uh, for multiple columns. Um, let's look at what are slice predicates? Uh, slice pre predicates were some of the things that we saw and when we looked at uh, the thrift code or when we looked at hectare examples for uh, communicating with Cassandra. But uh, we also looked at slice predicate last time when we were dealing with Hadoop because we wanted to get a range of columns or multiple columns uh, in, in one uh, kind of um, uh, a slide or, or a split. So uh, what is the slice predic predicate is basically uh, it can be used for read as well as write operations, but what slice predicate uh, is typically used for reading uh, most of the time, but it can also be used for write operation. But uh, what it's, uh, it means is a, a specify a set of columns that you want to read um, and or write, and that's what a, a, a slice predicate is. It's a fancy name for um, uh, selecting multiple columns. So you can do um, uh, specify a predicate in two ways. You can specify the column names in a, uh, in, in a, in a, in a uh, slice predicate or you can support, if you can, there's an advanced thing where you can use a slice range. If you don't know the column names, you can specify the slice range. Uh, that's how it basically what the, the input format and all those things uh, does. Uh, but this is a very advanced thing. I would uh, not recommend using the slice ranges and I'll talk uh, why uh, when we go to the example thing. Most of the times if you want to use the slice predicate, use the column names because there's a, a bit of risk in using the slice range uh, facility. Okay, so uh, let's look at the example. Uh, if you want to use the slice predicate by using the column uh, names, this is how you use it. Basically what it does is it uh, you, uh, you know the name of the column and it basically uh, gets the, the byte array of that because you know internally everything is saved as bytes uh, in, in Cassandra so you need to convert that to the byte array uh, and then it would match those those, those column names. Uh, you can specify multiple columns uh, that you are known um, for to you and you want to get the, those values. Say you have a, a hotels uh, table and then you want to uh, there the um, columns like number of rooms uh, or location and then the price, so these are the three uh, 
uh, column names that you want to uh, read, you can specify them as, as a slice predicate and all those three columns would be returned to you in one call. So it provides you performance penalty when you want to read more than one column um, if you want to retrieve that. Now get slice can be used for columns also as super column, but we know that super columns are probably going away, so need, need not be worried about it. So uh, let's look at the the kind of the signature of how you use a, a, a get slice operation. So the gets underscore slice is basically the function call in which you get uh, get the slice predicate. So this is a typical example of how you would use it through the Java code. So gets underscore slice is the name of the function uh, list um, uh, would return either a column or a super column type. So basically there is an interface called as i column. So i column uh, basically derives column as well as super column. So you'll get a list of i columns. Um, then get underscore slice is, is the function call. You specify the key, basically the convert the, the it to a byte array, basically specify the key, you specify the column parent and then you uh, column family basically and then you specify the, the slice predicate. Uh, so in, in, uh, we'll see how you create a slice predicate and then you also specify the consistency level because you are doing a read operation. So if you want to maintain a higher consist consistency level you can specify that too. Now, can slice ranges. Now, this is uh, or, or trickier type, uh, or this is also available as a way of retrieving uh, column information. So, if you don't know the name of the columns um, and uh, you want to uh, retrieve uh, multiple columns in, in a way, uh, you can use it by specifying slice range. Now, given in the example, if you look at the, the slice range here, you have seen a start range and a finish range. What a start range and a finish range basically specifies is the byte range from where you start reading your bytes for a particular column and where you end it. So uh, if in the example, if you look at uh, the, the column names given here, uh, like age and name, and you are specifying to get bytes thing. Now most of people might get confused in the example saying that, uh, okay, we saw in the previous things that the, the slice uh, by column names was probably simple to understand. You have a name, you convert, uh, you get the bytes for that and Cassandra knows it easily. But in the slice range, again, you are doing a column name and, the, and, and the, then you are doing a range. But I don't know the name of the columns. But uh, this is just as an example. But what you can do is basically you need to set the slice start range low enough and the slice start finish range high enough so that uh, most of the time you uh, assume uh, hoping that all your column values would be returned in, in that byte range. So uh, this is kind of a tricky operation to do, only recommended if you really don't know any of the metadata while you are doing a programming way. Uh, you can certainly find out information about what are the column names using the SQL interface, like you can use the SQL asset interface or the SQL uh, CLI interface and find out all the column family column names. So I won't recommend using the slice range example, but it is there for people who are very advanced users and uh, you want to use it uh, for doing some advanced manipulation, what you do is basically set the slice range value to uh, a byte value low enough and, uh, and a, slight, uh, a slice range um, finish value to a high enough based on the knowledge of how much long your data is. Um, basically you set those byte values and then you s specify uh, uh, as a slight predicate. So if you want, if you don't know the column values and you just want to do some kind of a hacking to find out what are the different column names, so, uh, uh, there, there is some special need to do that. You could certainly use that. I won't recommend you uh, using this, this slice range API because it's it's uh, uh, it's not a foolproof API. Uh, the, the start range and finish range have to be manipulated. So if you want to do some kind of trial error thing, you could use that. But uh, most of the times I won't recommend to do that. Uh, the preferred way is to go through the Cassandra uh, command line interface and find out what the, the names of the columns are so that it becomes easier. Okay, uh, let me see if there are any questions to this point so that uh, we can go ahead. Okay, a lot of questions. Let's take it one by one. 
Uh, so there is a question from Samir asking what is the use case of using by thrift again um, uh, let me reiterate that we don't uh, Cassandra application developers don't have to do anything with thrift only you might um, need to know the knowledge of thrift if there is an API that hasn't been written say you are using some language uh, a very recent language like go and you want to use uh, that as a client for talking to Cassandra you need to know a thrift and how to generate uh, all those functions that the Cassandra API offers uh, via Go. But if you're using any of the other languages like uh, Java and Python, there are already APIs that are written. For Java, there's a Hector API that is, that is uh, written. Uh, so you can use that uh, API instead of writing from scratch from thrift. So as an application developer, you do not know how thrift functions. Um, all the thing or, or the reason why I've kept thrift is to un, uh, to make you guys understand how it kind of communicates or just to give you a briefer of what is the internal way of communication in, in, in Cassandra. So Shweta is asking is there any support for Arrow or protocol buffers? Uh, unfortunately not at this point of time Cassandra just uses thrift. Uh, maybe the reason why is because when they started writing uh, Cassandra uh, thrift was probably um, the the favorite uh, for the the developers of Cassandra. Uh, it came from uh, Facebook. Uh, very famously, a lot of developers uh, for Cassandra initially Cassandra developers came from Facebook, and Thrift is also came from Facebook. So that's why probably the reason why Thrift was so widely used. Um, so there's a question from Partipan uh, saying in RDBMS indexes uses the B tree. How does Cassandra handle? Can you please go a little uh, how indexing works internally? So internally there, there's a lot of different algorithms that Cassandra uses and probably uh, going through all those algorithms are out of scope of what we are talking here. You can uh, find all this information on the Apache Cassandra website. Uh, there's a lot of documentation available. Uh, it can give you the details but most of the times uh, the question that you have asked in terms of the exact algorithm of how it handles, you need to uh, start reading code on the uh, for the Apache framework. Then only you know these these things are very uh, um, those uh, level of uh, details are very less documented in a, in a document or such. Most of the times you'll have to look into the code and find out. Huh? But it certainly uses a combination of B trees and some advanced algorithm. It also uses uh, pro, um, what um, bloom filters and all those things for for doing indexing um, um, in Cassandra. But uh, so for details, please uh, try to look into the documentation. If I find any any good link uh, explaining, then I'll I'll pass it on to you. So Asit is asking write down the SQL, uh, syntax for SQL for adding a column to an existing column family. Uh, okay. Let me look at if I already have that example there. Okay. So if you look at the, the ch uh, example uh, I've, I have on chart, Oops, sorry. Where did it go? Okay. So this is how you create a column family you uh, insert things uh, in, a, in a particular column family and what was the thing of adding a column. You can uh, certainly keep on adding, uh, say insert into users, you can keep on adding say key value or you can say some some new, um, uh, yeah. so insert is basically the thing you can keep on for adding, uh, so you can specify the same key uh, if this is not the password, say if it was some other column, you already have a password. If you want to add, say, a new column, say column three or something, and you can change it to uh, and give the specifier whatever the value that you have to say uh, the new uh, the value for that particular column. This is the command that you can use for in adding columns. So uh, what this would do, say, you have a, a password column already. Uh, using two insert statements won't override the password column, so both the columns would still be present. What you need to specify is specify the same key. So to give you a more concrete example, uh, say 
uh, yesterday you had uh, a password column and this was the statement that you executed yesterday and today if you execute the, the, the next line what it would do is add another column called as column 3 so uh, both the things both the times you're using the same row key you're just using the insert statement that's the way you can keep on adding uh, new columns so Shweta is asking having secondary assist versus composite key which one is better so composite key is probably uh, for breaking your column into multiple rows so that's the the primary function of a composite key a secondary index is basically for finding or indexing the values of a particular column so if you if there is a column which is probably searched a, a, a hell lot and you if you want to index it uh, then probably the secondary index is the way to go Narendra is asking example of a slice predicate I think I already showed you guys the example of a slice predicate if there is something that wasn't clear let me know uh, what is a byte array so Praveen uh, byte array is basically a, a Java uh, byte so if you are familiar with any of the programming languages uh, byte is, is a data type in uh, in Java programming language and an array of, of, of bytes is what a byte array is so it's if you're familiar with uh, an array of integers a byte array is an array of bytes so it's basically born through the core level so anything is basically can be represented as bytes so a byte array is basically uh, uh, an array of bytes Narendra is asking what is the security protocol in Cassandra um, I'm not sure how to exactly answer this question but uh, Cassandra internally keeps all this uh, data internally encrypted using the thrift so um, it has uh, you uh, and me do not you just know the API to that but we don't know the exact implementation to that but you can certainly add your own layer so Cassandra by default does not specify or support any kind of uh, security layer but you can certainly add another security layer by using a Kerberos or some kind of uh, security protocol on top of Cassandra and can use it but as of such Cassandra does not come packaged with Cassandra uh, with any kind of security thing there is a lot of effort going on uh, to add the, the Kerberos layer in, in, in Cassandra so this would be uh, helpful yeah. Yes, Kerberos is a, is the security protocol. Um, um, that's that's right. So Partipin is asking. My question was, what data structure used for indexing? Uh, this is not uh, out of topic. So uh, I kind of answered you the question, Partipin. What I'm trying to say is, it internally uses B3 plus. There are different data structures like Bloom filters. It does not use B3 by um, only. It uses multiple data structures to keep indexing in a in a in a better way. Uh, if you want to find out the exact algorithm, then you'll have to read documentation. Okay. So we saw slice ranges. Let's look at the DDL part in Cassandra. How to create a DDL? I kind of gave you examples, but let's look at more examples about creating use spaces, uh, the use words. So this should uh, be very easy for you guys because we already covered these topics in some previous modules. So create key space. Uh, look at the syntax, and I would recommend you guys uh, who have a VM open. Uh, start typing these things or if you can do it now or maybe after the class you can try these examples out uh, but basic sent syntax starts with creating a key, sp a key space you specify the name you specify the cre uh, strategy class if there is any because um, this this could be an optional part and then they, they could be multiple options so uh, let me open up with the, the example I showed you last time so it's uh, much more easier So here's an example of creating a key space. So you can create a key space, a sample one, you can specify the strategy class. So uh, we saw that there were two kind of topologies. There was a simple uh, uh, topology or there could be a network topology. So there could be two uh, strategy classes there. 
and then um, there could be an advanced uh, options like key value pairs. Say, since you are using the network uh, topology strategy, uh, you could uh, specify uh, the uh, uh, advanced uh, replic VF replication. So you can say strategy options, say data center one, um, that was my, my primary uh, location of data center, and three is my replication factor. You, so this is the way you can create a, a key space in in using the SQL interface, uh, we also saw the the word uh, or the use of use keyword. Very simple. Just say use key space, and then you'll be uh, switched to that uh, particular key space. Uh, another some examples of altering key spaces. What you basically do is uh, have your create uh, key space statements, and then provide a colon uh, a colon equal to, and then the alt key space identify, you say alter key space and then you specify what you want to alter with what properties that you want to alter. Again, dropping key space is uh, very simple, say drop key space, the name of the key space. Um, if you look at, these are all very, very simple things uh, about creating tables, uh, dropping tables, uh, pretty easy to understand. Uh, create table is also simple, you say create table or column family, and then importantly, you can say if not exists. So if it exists, you don't want to override. So you can specify if not exists, then create uh, this with this definition, with these options. Pretty standard. You can specify uh, the storing strategy. You can specify the clustering strategy um, for this. So these are the examples of create table. Ultra table is also very simple in terms of syntax. Say ultra table or the column family name. Give the name and the instructions and then you basically say alter this uh, for this type or add or drop some kind of things. Um, let's look at syntaxes. Oh, so, um, uh, syntaxes for dropping tables. So if you want to uh, drop table, well, basically you have a drop table statement and then colon drop table if exists, um, give the table name. Truncate is also supported in, in Cassandra through the SQL interface. Uh, very easy, truncate table name. Now, uh, creating an index, we saw uh, how we could create uh, indexes. Uh, so you specify create, or if you want to have your custom things, um, uh, basically say create index, if not uh, existing, on which uh, table name, on which uh, column name, uh, using what kind of uh, algorithm you want to use. You can uh, have your own um, uh, inverted index or um, if you want some other indexing uh, class to be used, you could use that uh, plugin as well. Dropping index is also very simple. You can say drop index, but you can also say if it exists, then only drop it so it's much more faster operations. All these examples are very, very simple in terms of DDL, so I would encourage you guys to try them out um, at your leisure. Um, inserting is also simple. Um, this just insert table name and identifier. Um, if you look at the, the concrete example that I had here, uh, very simple. You just say insert into users. This way specify your key and then your, your call name. You can have all these other additional things, but they are all app optional things. Uh, like uh, the collection literal, if you have a, a table with collection and all those things, uh, you can specify the time to live and all those uh, advanced properties um, with Cassandra. So the, an important thing with regards to time to live is you can have a cluster wise uh, white time to live or you can have a table specific time to live. So if you want to modify that, so in, in, in an example here, in, in an insert statement here, I haven't specified the time to live for these columns. So uh, the default would be whatever is the cluster wide property that you, you have used. Uh, but if you want to say change, uh, you want to keep the, the, the column three only for say 24 hours, you just specify the, the TTL here, uh, the TTL and then the, the value, the integer value should be something uh, say 2200 zero, zero seconds. It's in seconds basically for, for 48 hours. Update statement again. I would say pretty simple. Um, so go over all those things. 
um, in terms of you can specify the list set and list things if you have a set and a list and a map kind of uh, identifiers how we want to uh, update these statements again let's look at the, the delete is also simple you can specify delete it even using a timestamp range where you can specify delete certain things where a timestamp was somewhere from this to that uh, you can use that as well okay let's look at uh, some of the batch uh, strategies so um, in terms of Cassandra what batch uh, supports is, is um, a way of uh, doing things in, in a bar it has a lot of advantages because uh, for, for performance reasons if you're using using the batch statement uh, a lot of operations are done in bulk so it provides a lot of performance benefits so what batch does is basically supports uh, client supported uh, global timestamp for doing uh, a particular set of operations or so a set of instructions are set uh, based on an optional global timestamp you can also specify the consistency level uh, based on for a batch statement so it will ensure that all those those batch statements are done for a particular consistency now there it's not the um, um, it does not have any kind of isolation guarantees as such uh, if you look at uh, the RDBMS batch things but uh, what it would ensure is at least each operation is atomic so each operation is uh, done in an atomic fashion uh, the way you can specify a batch operation in Cassandra is uh, this way you say begin batch then specify the consistency level uh, say the timestamp or the time to live then you have your DML statements, uh, a list of DML statements that you want to execute and then say apply batch. So what it, this would ensure is it will uh, do all those DML statements in, in a batch fashion um, should be um, really good in terms of uh, adding your performance to Cassandra. Okay. Another example of, of batch statement uh, these are basically templates on how to use a, a batch statement. So it says begin, uh, batch, and then you have different use options. You have a, 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 a batch uh, statement member, and then you say apply batch. So this is uh, some of the examples. If you want to do an insert, if you want to do an update, or you want to delete, and you want to do it in a, in a batch fashion, this is how we do it. Okay. Let's look at batch mutate, but before I jump to that, let me see if there are any questions. Okay, uh, Madhusudan is asking, uh, what is the, explain the TTL. So TTL is time to live. Um, uh, I think we covered that way ago, but uh, I'm happy to re repeat that. Basically what time to live specifies is when you create a, a column. So if I go back to my example here, say if I have this, this users thing, um, uh, I have key, uh, I have column called as password, now I want to add another column called as column 3. I have a particular value to that, but I specify a time to live. What time to live uh, specifies is this is the number of seconds that you want to keep Cassandra. So cluster wise, say my all the columns have time to live for say one year. So by default, my cluster-wise configuration says all columns um, can have values till one year. So till one year, Cassandra won't internally delete any values for all the columns. But I don't want to keep it for all the columns, the same configuration. Uh, I just want to keep this column for a particular, say, 48 hours, after which I don't need that value uh, of that column. I don't need that column. So I, what I would do is specify the time to live for that column so after 48 hours what uh, Cassandra would do is it will look it will keep on scanning so every certain time period Cassandra keeps scanning uh, if there are any columns that are expired so uh, after 48 hours this column would be basically expired so Cassandra would internally delete this column and get rid of this column so you don't have to keep maintaining uh, so most of uh, often what happens is you create columns in a database and then you don't require it or uh, there were some other members uh, in your team who, who um, kind of uh, added uh, those um, columns 
and you don't know about them so they could be time to live would be a good strategy to be added in, in that fashion. What time to live specifies is after this X amount of time your column would be deleted by Cassandra internally. Okay, so let's look at batch mutates. Uh, I, I hope the, those batch operations was simple. Um, again, batch mutate is nothing but uh, uh, doing the insert and update operations in, in a batch fashion. Uh, so uh, we, we saw those, those statements that we could do it in the, the SQL. Batch mutate is uh, an API call that you can do it through the Hector API. So batch underscore mutate is a function that in which you can specify a list of uh, operations that you want to do in terms uh, rather than doing one operation at a time you can specify all this thing in the batch mutate operation and that would be um, done on the Cassandra server side in, in a batch fashion. Again it specifies uh, a lot of performance benefits when you are doing things in a batch versus when you are doing in, in one at a time. You can also do batch deletes so say you want to remove a lot of records at a time rather than deleting with one by one you just file it up in, in a batch and then it just execute the, the batch de delete operation. Batch delete internally uses the batch mutate operation because batch mutate is kind of a generic operation. Batch delete just uses that kind of operation. Okay, so let's look at what's the workflow of uh, uh, the, the batch delete. Say you want to batch, you have three columns, say hotel price and delete, and you want to um, basically do a batch delete. What it does is, once you send uh, that uh, list of uh, deletes that you want to do, it uh, uses a slice predicate. So it uh, say I have say 10 columns and I want to delete three out of them. So it would uh, use the slice predicate to uh, uh, pass on the list of columns that you want to delete. And it basically internally creates the deletion object and mutation object. So it would use the batch underscore mutate function call. Uh, that's part of the Cassandra API. And then on the server side, it would uh, delete, remove those uh, records uh, from um, the Cassandra. Uh, if they are in the mem tables, it would remove it from memory. If they are on the SS tables, it would mark tombstones so that they won't be read uh, whenever you want to read those those particular columns. That's how the deleting would uh, a batch delete would happen. Basically, it's a simple concept. Rather than doing one thing at a time, you do it in, in a batch. Okay, so let's look at some concrete examples now uh, in terms of creating a, a user. Say you have a, a, um, a new logging accounts kind of thing and you want to create a login name password for an application. So in uh, SQL SH you can say create a, a, a user uh, and then you can specify the password. If it's, you can also specify the rule, uh, role, the role for that. And then if you say list users, it would give you all those a uh, list of users that you can use through the SQL SH interface. So uh, Cassandra uses and then you can find if it's a super user or not. The, most of the times this can be used by the admin to keep on adding users, deleting users. Uh, again, simple way to drop a user. Let's look at the, the security configuration. There was a, a question about security. So this is how it talks about uh, the security. Uh, let's look at, so this is how you can plug in your security thing. There's a auth, simple auth authenticator, which is a, a simple way of authentication that the Cassandra provides. But this is the interface that you want to probably inherit. Uh, basically override a lot of functions by providing your own implementation or maybe add uh, Kerberos uh, as a layer so you can use it for integration uh, using these classes. It, it provides a pluggable security. Uh, that's the good part of it. Uh, so again, uh, very simple types of security. One is the simple authenticator that we saw. The example here, the org Apache Cassandra auth simple authenticator is just a simple uh, way of authentication between two systems. Um, that's the by default implementation that it, it has, but if you want to have a more advanced programmatic uh, things, you can do it th that way too. Or you can provide your own uh, third party layer like Kerberos security can be a plug plugged in Cassandra. Uh, that's also possible. So the Cassandra uh, simple authenticator class has basically two modes of specifying a password. You can either specify it in plain text 
probably is used uh, or applicable for very simple application, internal application, dev work that you want to do, or you can for production level things you can have an MD5 in encryption uh, done. You specify an uh, MD5 encryption, uh, encryption and all your uh, data would be um, uh, for authentication would be in, in an MD5 format. 